I have mentioned Carolyn McIntyre's book, Caring for Words in a Culture of Lives, many times over the course of this podcast's five years or so. It was, upon first read, a formative and grounding resource, and it continues to be. In part because I've historically had a tendency to talk too much, (laughs) putting too many words on the table and muddying the connection that better words, more thoughtful words, might have otherwise forged with those I'm speaking with. In the same way, McIntyre warns that a misuse or a careless use of words disconnects us from the heart of the things we're talking about. That if I truly love a subject or an idea or an experience or even a truth, it's my responsibility through language to communicate that subject or idea or experience or truth in a way that others might come to appreciate it. That when there's a disconnect between a thought that I'm moved by and the ability of someone I care about to perceive it, that gap is my problem. And the problem is one of language. In short, Carolyn McIntyre suggests that language is a primary expression of love. Love for the things I take interest in and love for those I'm living life with and speaking to. And insofar as that's the case, that language is an expression of love, how important it is that I recognize the often tragic limitations of language. My words, like your words, can never quite capture or enlighten every aspect, angle, or nuance of life and the particular elements of life in which I find joy and pain. Which is why I'm so often moved by the courage of those willing to put the best of their words on the table, while knowing that those same words can only do so much. It's also why I'm so often moved by the courage of those who, after a time, find and apply new words to older conversations. Older conversations in which we've grown maybe too comfortable with our language gaps and the divisions we settle into because of those language gaps. For instance, I've marveled that those who have faithfully approached the language around God is love and been not only consistent enough, but humble enough to allow a phrase like that to become less about particular conclusions and more about possibilities, which is often what I see in stories about Jesus, who, as conversations about the love of God hit the table, ends up handling questions like, who is my neighbor? And in response, Jesus offers a story which has layers of cultural implications and nuance and a much broader set of possibilities than the conclusions his audience has learned to associate with the word God or love. The possibilities and pathways available in the divine will always be infinitely more interesting and beautiful than the language we use to point at them. Which leads me to think that perhaps the best we can do with our language is hope to point others, and even our own souls at times, at the good, true, and beautiful. And then trust not only the fuller reality of those things, but even other people's experiences of those things to fill in the gap, as it were. Maybe everything else is an exercise in control. So I think of recent writers like Rachel Held Evans. And I don't find any real scandal in the conclusions she was trying to get people to come to, if there really were any of those. I think the real scandal of Rachel Held Evans' legacy was the constant and wild suggestion that the love of God is actually for everyone. And that whenever someone is left out of that, everyone, we've come up against a limitation of language and human will, and we can do better. I love that. (laughs) I really do. Namely because I really do believe That if I'm not actually scandalized on occasion, I must not actually be paying attention to God. See, great religious language points us to possibilities beyond the words we are currently using, and then invites us to trust the rest of our process to the divine, who desires far more than the understanding and cognition we chase with words, but desires instead relationship, an ongoing, evolving growing and deepening relationship that is far beyond understanding. So, maybe we can take the pressure off ourselves and those we're giving our precious attention to by not having to trust so deeply and so fully the messengers specific. Instead, perhaps we can learn to trust the larger process that each of those messengers is part of.